fact, it appears that the universe has been incredibly fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life from the very moment of its inception. And this fine-tuning is beyond comprehension. The fine-tuning argument is the idea that the known universe and everything within it owes its existence to a large number of physical laws which are very apparently finely tuned to the existence of people, planets, stars and galaxies. For example, if you, took, if you look at the speed of light in a vacuum, which is 300,000 kilometers per second, this is a constant. It's an example of a constant of nature. What this means is that it doesn't matter where or when you are in the universe, this number is always the same. It never changes. Now, the speed of light happens to be a very important physical constant because it features in one of the most famous equations in all of physics, E equals mc squared. This equation determines how much nuclear energy is released in nuclear reactions at the centers of stars. So you can see that if the speed of light were any faster than it is, then stars would burn through their nuclear fuel far more quickly than they actually do, and potentially even blow themselves apart entirely. On the other hand, if the speed of light were much slower than it is, then stars would not output enough heat to maintain their own existence against the inward pull of gravity, and they would collapse in on themselves before having any chance of ever forming a planetary system like the one which we live in. So it seems then that all these physical constants occupy some range of values within which they must lie if people like we are ever to have any chance of existing. So it begs the question, was there some kind of intelligent tuner to fine tune these constants to what they are? Or is there some other naturalistic explanation at hand? This is the fine tuning argument and it's what I'm going to examine in this video. Our search for life in the cosmos is complicated by the fact that we don't fully understand what we mean by the word life. There may be many forms of life in the universe which would be unrecognizable as life to us if we were to encounter them, given that all that we know of life exists thus far on a single planet, the Earth. But we have to start somewhere. Life on Earth seems to exist almost anywhere where there is liquid water. It requires a source of energy and some chemistry. So that's where we're going to start looking. In the past 20 years or so, we have discovered thousands of planets orbiting other stars, so much so that we can now do some basic statistics with them. It seems that the most common type of planet in the galaxy lies intermediate in mass and size between the Earth and Neptune. These are often called super-Earth or sub-Neptune type planets. And interestingly, there are no examples of such a world in our own solar system that we yet know of. Does this mean our solar system is unique? Well, who knows? So it seems then that on the face of it, the prospects for life might have been given a bit of a boost with the discovery of all these thousands of extrasolar planets throughout the cosmos. But we must be careful not to jump to conclusions. The mere existence of a planet is far from sufficient by itself to guarantee the existence of life there. So if you can imagine that this is a star, as we travel outwards from the star, the temperature is going to decrease until we reach a point, a point at which any planet orbiting the star is going to be cool enough to be able to support liquid water on its surface. If we carry on traveling outwards from the star, the temperature is going to carry on decreasing until we reach another point where it becomes too cool for liquid water to exist, and any world beyond that point will be frozen solid. So we use these two definitions to define what we mean by the inner and outer edges of what's called the habitable zone, a circular region around all stars in the cosmos within which planets orbiting may support liquid water on their surfaces. Now, it turns out that there isn't a universal definition of what we mean by the habitable zone. For example, if you have a planet, say, here, lying within the habitable zone, then it's not just a matter of how far from the star the planet lies. Many planets have atmospheres which are going to affect how much heat can reach the surface and how much is retained there. So if you imagine this planet has an atmosphere which consists of a lot of, say, carbon dioxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, then theoretically you could take this planet and move it a lot further out. And that would therefore define another outer edge of your habitable zone. By contrast, you can imagine that if a planet had a very, say, cloudy atmosphere, clouds are very good at reflecting light back into space before it reaches the ground. Therefore, you could even translate this planet further in and define some alternative inner definition as well. So, as you can see, there are a number of ways we can define these habitable zones. 
Even under the most optimistic definitions, however, in our solar system, there are perhaps four worlds that lie within the habitable zone, the Earth, Moon, Venus, and Mars. And yet, as we can quite clearly see, the Earth is the only one of those four which supports a flourishing ecosystem on its surface. The others are either far too hot or far too cold or have no atmosphere at all. So clearly, there is a lot more to the story of life than whether a planet lies within a habitable zone or not. Now, there's another aspect to this too, which is that as stars get older, they heat up. Now, what that means is that the boundaries of these habitable zones are going to move. Generally, they're going to move outwards. If we have a planet that begins its life within the habitable zone, it may therefore at some point find itself too close to the star to support liquid water. About one billion years ago, the inner boundary of our solar system's habitable zone passed across the orbit of Venus. The result was a runaway greenhouse effect. Water is a very powerful greenhouse gas, and so any water on the surface of Venus at that time evaporated away into the atmosphere. That caused more heat to be trapped at the surface, and eventually we have a situation like we have today where Venus is the hottest of the terrestrial planets, even though it's the second furthest from the Sun, after Mercury. At the other end of the scale, we have Mars. Now, it does seem that sometime around three to four billion years ago, Mars itself was also more habitable than it is today. It had a much thicker atmosphere, and we can tell this by looking at images of its surface. Many landforms on the surface of Mars appear to have been shaped by water in some form, river valleys, um, coastlines, deltas, and robotic landers have detected materials on the surface which we know only form in the presence of liquid water. So it does seem that Mars too, at some point in its past, had a much thicker atmosphere than it does today. Now this is still consistent with our story, because if most of the atmosphere of Mars in its early history was carbon dioxide, then that would be enough to keep the surface warm enough for liquid water. But as you can see, we have a situation where habitability is not just dependent on space, where a planet exists in space, but where it exists in time as well. Life therefore appears to occupy an oasis both in space and time, which is dependent on a whole range of factors. And certainly we don't know the whole story yet. Now what about life? Well, if you come to a beach like this in southern England and walk along the beach after a storm, you might come across something like this. As it happens, this beach isn't just any old beach. In fact, it's a very old beach. This is Charmouth Beach in Dorset, and it comprises one of a number of beaches along this stretch of the English coastline called the Jurassic Coast, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, because here is where you can find some of the richest sources of fossils in the world. Indeed, the entire field of paleontology had some of its earliest pioneers cutting their teeth here. Now, generally speaking, what happens is after a storm or some kind of uh, heavy weather, rocks from the, the cliff behind me can drop out of the cliff onto the beach, and you can simply walk along and pick up fossils. This ammonite lived about 170 million years ago. As this creature grew, it would add new worlds to this shell, move into those and vacate the chambers behind it. It would then fill those chambers with gas and this shell would then act like a buoyancy aid. So this creature would actually swim this way up in the sea. It had tentacles, eyes, a brain, a mouth, a digestive system. By all accounts, this was a complex living organism. Now, life forms with anything like this kind of complexity only evolved in the last 15% or so of the total amount of time that life has existed on this planet. In the preceding 4 billion years or thereabouts, the most talkative life form on this planet would have been plankton. So can we really argue that the universe, or indeed planet Earth, is really fine-tuned to the existence of complex life? Can we surely not make a more stronger, convincing case that if there were any beneficiaries to fine-tuning, then it might even be ammonites like these that survived? These things survived until the, um, the destruction of the dinosaurs, and that means that they lived on this planet for something like a thousand times longer than we humans have been here. Of course, that's just the solar system, but what about the rest of the universe? Remember, the argument is that the universe is fine-tuned. Now, if that's so, then what can we make of this? If we look at the universe as a whole, we can see that it consists of almost entirely empty space with a material density of no more than an atom or two per cubic meter. It's heated to a couple of degrees above absolute zero by the residual heat left over from the Big Bang. And it's immersed in very damaging, highly ionizing radiation, which wouldn't do life any good at all. Now, 
if we're going to argue that the universe is fine-tuned to life, why might we be tempted to argue that? Is it simply because life exists here in the first place? Now, I know that seems like an obvious statement to make, but if the mere existence of something in the universe is enough to justify arguing that the universe is fine-tuned to whatever that is, then surely we should be making the same argument for everything else that exists in the universe too, if we're going to be objective. So why are we not also arguing that the universe is fine-tuned to the existence of black holes, neutron stars, sticks, cliffs, beaches, and anything else? Are we not, in short, simply saying that the universe is fine-tuned to being, well, the universe? This would be true of any universe, with any combination of physical laws and with any combination of physical constants. So, in my eyes, this seems to be a very redundant argument. We don't need it. We're not learning anything about the cosmos in which we live. And certainly, given the environmental damage we're causing to our own planet, in that is an implicit assumption that the universe we live in is extremely inhospitable to life. And therefore, the oases of life which do exist need to be preserved by those life forms which live there. And in our case, that's us.